It may have been the greatest army of all time, conquering and controlling an empire that stretched across the ancient Western world. It was ruthless, disciplined, and feared by all, not just by its enemies, who died in their millions, but by its own emperors, who often paid the price of the army's wrath. And yet, these soldiers were builders as well as destroyers, helping to spread a culture that became the bedrock of Western civilization. What was it that made this army so dominant? How was it able to rule and reshape the classical world? And why did it eventually fall? This is the story of the Roman war machine. By the second century AD, Rome's empire had expanded about as far as it could. Now it was time for consolidation. The Roman army, instead of plundering and butchering new territories, turned around and did the opposite. It started building them up. Where they had destroyed, the legions created. Because the army was the first Roman presence in a new land, the soldiers had to be able to build their own forts and defenses, and so, each legion had its own architects, surveyors, and engineers. The soldiers themselves provided the ready manpower, and some of their work has lasted 2,000 years. We tend to be very arrogant in the late 20th century and think that we have invented wonderful methods of building, but we shouldn't underestimate the Romans as engineers. They're great as soldiers, but they are supreme as engineers. With that engineering skill, soldiers were sometimes put to work on civilian projects during the long periods of peace after Roman conquest. It was a way of setting Rome's stamp on conquered lands. The most basic and most famous of the army building projects were the roads. They enabled the legions to move rapidly to any trouble spot and also allowed trade to flourish. 53,000 miles of roads were built to connect the empire. All roads really did lead to Rome. Some building projects were breathtaking. For example, the Pont du Gau in southern France. It's one of the highest bridges in the Roman world, standing 160 feet high, and was part of an aqueduct that carried water to the city of Nîmes. The engineering is precise. The aqueduct slopes so gently that over its 30-mile journey, it falls just 30 feet from start to finish. The bridge was built around 50 AD. By then, the Romans already knew how to build something this big without even using mortar. The lower part of the bridge is built with these big stone blocks. Some of them weigh six tons, which is really impressive. And um, in this case, I mean, if you use big stone blocks like that, you, you don't necessarily need mortar because if the stones are perfectly cut, they're heavy enough. And we know that they floated the stones up on rafts towards the bridge itself. And then afterwards, they could raise the stones. They, have all, they had all sorts of systems, such as winches, pulleys, and hoists, and so on. Unlike the great buildings in Rome itself, which were carefully documented, we don't know exactly who built works like this in the provinces, because no records were kept. But it's possible the army had at least some role in the Pont du Gard. We have absolutely no proof that the army did help, but it is a theory, of course, because we know that they needed the know-how, the organization, the labor, uh, and so on and so forth. The aqueduct's water flowed through a covered channel that ran along the top of the bridge. Thanks to gravity, it delivered 20,000 tons of water a day to the city of Nîmes. What you can see here is, first of all, the size of it. It's about six feet high and four feet wide, which is really uh, pretty considerable. And uh, it supplied a city of some 30,000 inhabitants with all the water they needed, actually. Apart from the obvious benefits such works brought to the empire, 
using the soldiers as builders had other payoffs. First, it let the emperor sleep a little better at night because an army that's busy working has less time to plan political overthrows. The modern army has a great program of tank washing and tank maintenance just to keep the troops occupied. The Roman army solved that problem of keeping your troops occupied by turning them into builders. Building was one of the least favorite activities for soldiers, especially the heavy work of stone cutting. And there were even mutinies by units who felt they were overworked. Every common soldier's dream was to get out of this kind of work by being designated as immunis, literally a soldier immune from the worst jobs because of his skills. Those with immune status included blacksmiths, surveyors, medics, arrowsmiths, trumpet makers, and keepers of sacrificial animals. Another payoff from using soldiers as builders was that it helped to keep conquered people passive by giving them the advantages of Roman civilization. They could then be brought within the Roman world and given the benefits of Roman civilization, of Roman urban life, of food, social organization, bathing. The spread of hot water and bathing is an important part of the Roman takeover of northwestern Europe. A fine example of the good life that Rome brought to its conquered citizens is the amphitheater at the military colony of Nîmes in southern France. Built in the first century AD, it holds 20,000 people and is still used for concerts and bullfights. 2,000 years ago, it was used for animal hunts and military demonstrations. Through gladiator contests, the Romans were able to perpetuate the notion among conquered people of the superiority of the Roman warrior. The amphitheater was also a place where the people of the conquered provinces could see the majesty of the empire, literally. We are quite sure that we had the emperor and very important magistrates of Roman Empire coming to Nîmes. Uh, so it was, in a way, television for the people here to see these uh, personalities. And in a way, they could feel part sitting here uh, a part of this empire to keep the people quiet and satisfied, we may say. Roman building in the provinces also helped to indoctrinate local people with the godlike qualities of the emperors. One example is the theater at the military colony of Orange in France. Also built well enough to still be used today, it has a wall 120 feet high behind the stage, equal to a 10-story building. Not only would the size and sweep have impressed local inhabitants, but punctuating the wall is a statue of the Emperor Augustus, looking down on them as if from the heavens. The back wall of this theater is one of a very impressive Roman building as it is now. But it used to be much more impressive with the marble covering, the three floors, and on the top of the scene was the statue of the emperor himself, looking at the spectators as a god. But it wasn't just with architecture that the Roman army spread civilization through the empire. As we'll see, the thirsty legions helped to start the European wine industry. Whenever one raises a glass of French or German wine, there's an unconscious toast to the Roman army, because it was the soldiers who made some of the first plantings of vines in many of the great wine-growing regions of Europe. As they conquered new territories, the vine went with them. The Romans did uh, bring vines to France, and the Roman army was part of that process, uh, as they were instrumental in bringing other crops and other aspects of Roman culture into Western Europe. It's not surprising the army planted vines, because each Roman soldier was given an allowance of two pints of wine a day. It's quite true that the Romans couldn't live without wines. It was part of their culture, it was part of their civilization, and uh, being abroad, if I may say so, they came over here, the very first thing they wanted to do is to make sure that they could get their favorite elixir over here. 
as it was certainly quite a problem to bring it in those old potteries. Before the Roman invasion, wine in France was so rare and so prized that the natives of France, the Gauls, paid Italian merchants the price of one slave for one large container, an amphora of wine. Until the Romans, winemaking in France was probably restricted to the area around the Greek colony of Marseille in the south. As Rome began to conquer France, soldiers and civilians began planting vines as they went, including the Rhone Valley, Burgundy, the Loire Valley, and Champagne, and also the Rhine and Moselle Valleys in Germany. In the Champagne district of northern France, Roman occupation may have helped the Champagne industry accidentally in a different way. Below the surface of the Champagne region, about 75 feet underground, there are more than 100 miles of cellars dug from the chalk. It's believed that some of these cellars may have begun as quarries in the first or second century AD to provide chalk for building blocks. Today, these underground chalk quarries serve as cellars for Champagne's 800 million bottles. But for a very different reason, it's believed these cellars may have been important to Romanized citizens towards the end of the empire. They were a possible refuge from raids by invading German tribes who envied the comforts of Roman life, including wine. There's no doubt that barbarians wanted to share in Roman luxuries. There are plenty of Roman luxuries that you find in uh, Germanic barbarian areas even before the invasions take place. They like to get hold of them through trade or gift or whatever. The cellars may also have been used as a refuge in more modern times. During both world wars, there was fierce fighting in the Champagne district, and civilians used the cellars for temporary safety. When the bombing started, people were uh, very soon coming here in the cellars, and we, we, we have found from a lot of furniture here, some uh, forks and knives and bottles and, and plates, everything, and we think that they were just living here for a couple of days, perhaps, just waiting for the end of the bombing. Even today, European defense chiefs apparently have their eye on using the Roman cellars again, if necessary. I've been showing Ron uh, uh, the cellars, a, a senior officer from NATO. And after the visit with a twinkle in the eye, he's a Christian, he's certainly the place I'd like to spend the Third World War conflict. Although the Roman army helped spread civilization as a way of keeping the peace in the conquered provinces, it was never afraid to use the stick as well as the carrot if the provincials got out of line. What should never be forgotten is that this peace was actually maintained by the threat of armed force. And within those lands, society as a whole was, was still pretty violent. It was still a slave-owning society. People were very frequently physically brutalized. Rome spread its distinct form of civilization throughout its empire, and yet the process carried within it the seeds of the empire's destruction. The civilized empire became a magnet to barbarian tribes living outside the empire who wanted a share of the Roman lifestyle. Rome almost flaunted its wealth at the barbarians by having many of its forts and colonies right on the borders of the empire in full view of the barbarians. The soldiers are the only sector of society who have pay and their pay is being spent in that area so you, you get these cities like Cologne and Mainz and, and, and Budapest Vienna and so forth growing up in, in what have previously been very barren areas and right across on the other side of the river so to speak are these unfortunate people who have nothing and this makes a magnet for them <laughs> wonderful network of roads so the barbarians who invade they go across the river and there's a milestone saying you know Rome 600 miles <laughs> this way I mean yeah that things are made much, so much easier as well as more attractive for them. One of the first major signs of trouble came in the 170s AD when Germanic tribes invaded Italy. They said they were forced to invade because of turf wars with other barbarian tribes. Rome writes comment among the bodies of the dead there were women and children and, and the tribe said look please take us into the empire. 
we are being uh, put under terrible pressure by the tribes from the interior, and, and we, we want land. Some of them were accepted to start with, but then it just became too much of a problem. The number of barbarian raids steadily increased throughout the 200s AD. Rome's borders were simply not as secure as they had been in earlier times. A major reason could be found in the east. A revitalized Persian Empire began retaliating to centuries of Roman raids and pushed into Roman territory. In the year 260 AD, the Persians even captured the Roman Emperor Valerian on their own territory and kept him prisoner for life. It's the Persian attacks on the eastern frontier that act, as it were, like the first domino in a series. Rome is forced to fight a series of very expensive defensive wars. No longer can war be funded by booty extracted from conquered people. This time, the empire, from its own resources, has to pay for the defense of its own frontiers. Having to shift troops to the east to fight the Persians left Rome's other borders less secure. There were constant raids, especially from German tribes, who in one battle killed the Roman Emperor Decius in the year 251. There were invasions of Roman Gaul and the Balkans, and Italy itself was invaded several times in the 260s AD. The raids stretched the logistics of the Roman army to the limit. The gathering of the troops and the going to the frontier takes place at walking pace, so no more than 20 miles a day. Uh, to put together a sizable force, get it to the right bit of the frontier, you're certainly talking weeks and maybe months. And there was another problem for the Romans. The barbarian tribes that Caesar and others had defeated so easily had learned tremendously from the Romans and were now ready to turn the tables. When Rome was building its empire, its ruthless and disciplined army was almost unbeatable against the often disorganized barbarian enemies. But by the 200s AD, things were changing. For centuries, many barbarians had been part of the Roman army, recruited by Rome to fight alongside the legions. Now that was beginning to backfire, as barbarian tribes used their newfound skills to fight for their own peoples against the empire. Very many of their warriors have, at one time or another, served in the Roman army. They're getting much more familiar with Roman tactics, and to some extent, they're starting to imitate them as well. Therefore, it's, it's a much more difficult task for the Romans to cope with. But the threats were not just external. The Roman legions, now under great pressure, turned to fighting with each other throughout the 200s AD, each wanting to put its own candidate on the emperor's throne. The infighting was so great that more than 30 different emperors were proclaimed in a period of 50 years. Very many soldiers were killed unnecessarily, huge amounts of treasure were wasted, and the destruction, which may have been quite localized within the empire, reduced the economic capacity of the Roman world to sustain the army which defended it. So in a way, the army, to some extent, cut its own throat. The Roman fort at Salzburg in Germany was just one of the many that fell into enemy hands during the 200s, as barbarian tribes swept across the border. The whole nature of the Roman military strategy was changing. In the early days of the empire, the army had been on the attack, conquering new territory and paying for its wars with captured treasure. But now the empire and its army were hunkering down defensively, even women and children were called on at times to help the army defend a town from attack, and many cities began building walls to try to keep the invaders out. So it's no, no surprise, by the 270s, a Roman emperor actually gives the word, Rome has got to have an enormous city wall, such as it hadn't had for 600 years. The style of forts was changing too. At the height of the empire, forts were often built in open ground to allow the army easy access and domination of the area. 
But by the late 200s, Roman forts like this one at Porchester in southern England were designed much more defensively, with many more towers for artillery and archers against barbarian attack. In this case, raids by Saxon fleets. The importance of this fort is that it symbolizes a fundamental change that overtakes Roman military strategy in the third century. The big D-shaped bastions behind me represent a shift from an offensive to a defensive posture. What this fort symbolizes, I think, is a change in an empire that's go-getting, that's aggressive, that's prepared to move out and expand, and rather change to an empire that's back on its heels, that's defensive, that's preparing not to expand, but is sitting and preparing to fight for its survival. By the late 200s AD, it looked as though the empire might be finished. But from the revolving door of changing emperors emerged two strong leaders who put the empire back on a solid footing. The first of them was Diocletian. Diocletian is certainly one of the most capable emperors. Remarkably, he rose up from a peasant class to rule. Uh, this in of itself is a tribute to the army as a means of social advancement. Uh, Diocletian rose up uh, due to his skill uh, as a soldier and as a commander. Uh, he transferred this skill into a reorganization of the empire. When Diocletian became emperor in 284, he restored the dwindling army to its former size, about 400,000 troops. He also turned the emperor's job into a committee. He appointed three other emperors, and the four of them, called the Tetrarchy, ruled the empire jointly. After Diocletian retired voluntarily, the Tetrarchy system fell apart from internal bickering. And then another strong soldier emperor, Constantine, took control. In 312, he won power in a pivotal civil war battle outside Rome. Although badly outnumbered, he won after claiming to see a vision of the cross in the noonday sky and hearing the words, conquer by this. Once he became emperor, he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine continued Diocletian's military reforms. He created a mobile army to back up the frontier garrisons. These field units could rush to counter trouble wherever it broke out. A central reserve, a mobile reserve, as well as having the troops all around the frontiers. Now, this was something which the Romans should have had before. If that had been in place uh, in a serious way at the beginning of the third century, they, they would have been able to react rapidly, as it was, to send troops from the northern frontier to the eastern frontier, or vice versa. Uh, it, it, it just didn't work. Constantine also created a new capital for the empire, moving away from Rome in the year 330 to the new Christian capital of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul in Turkey. This was a sign that the wealth and power of the empire were shifting to the east and that the Western Empire was heading for decline. Sadly, the new stability that Diocletian and Constantine had given the army and the empire largely died with them. The middle 300s AD saw a return to civil wars between the legions, each one wanting its commander to be emperor. Civil wars had the effect of weakening not only the army, but the economy too. Roman writers spoke of many farms lying waste. The peasants have been frightened away, or the peasants have been conscripted into the army, or the peasants have run away because they don't want to go into the army or because they, they have no money to pay taxes and they fear the consequences. The constant civil wars also had the effect of creating rampant inflation throughout the empire. Every time there's an attempt at becoming emperor, successful or otherwise, enormous numbers of extra coins are, are minted and distributed to, to, as a reward to the troops. When you get such an enormous number of coins in circulation, clearly prices shoot up. Basically what happens is people start losing confidence because the, this denarius is supposed to be silver and they gradually put in more and more non-silver into it until by the um, latter part of the uh, third century, the so-called denarius has perhaps 2% silver in it. 
Barbarian invaders took full advantage of the empire's internal problems. In Britain, tribes from Scotland stormed across Hadrian's Wall in the 360s. On the European mainland, German tribes were threatening, especially the Goths, who came from near the Black Sea. They were being driven from their homelands by fierce, bloodthirsty nomads, the Huns from Central Asia. To escape the Huns, the Goths begged for refuge inside the Roman Empire. The Goths are fleeing from the Huns, and they are clearly scared to death. And the Romans accept this explanation. The Romans actually ferry them across the Danube. So sometimes barbarians are simply running away from other barbarians. But after he allowed the Goths to settle, the Roman Emperor Valens decided he wanted them out. In 378, he personally led an army against them at Adrianople, north of Constantinople. It was a disastrous mistake. Acting on bad intelligence, the Romans were pinned between two Gothic armies. And the, the story as it goes that they can't use their weapons. They're trapped, they can't turn around, and they're massacred. Two-thirds of the army, I think about 12,000 men, are killed on that one day. The dead included the Emperor Valens. More importantly, the loss of so many troops at once weakened the Romans' capacity to defend the empire. Because at Adrianople, so many very important regiments were destroyed, the Roman army was never able actually to replace them in terms of either quality or quantity. So its military capacity overall was that much reduced. It was therefore unable properly to defend all of the frontiers thereafter. The Romans now were forced to let the Goths stay, and other barbarian tribes were allowed to settle too, provided they joined the Roman army. Rome had always used and trained foreign troops, but now barbarian armies are being conscripted wholesale to fight with the Romans. The real problem with barbarians is not individual barbarians in Roman units. It's when they come in large numbers and are employed by the Roman state uh, en masse, as it were, without going through Roman military training. The so-called barbarization of the Roman army was only one part of the problem. In the army as a whole, the once proud standards were beginning to fall away. Making war costs money. That's true today, and it was true for the Roman army. As the Roman Empire's economy weakened under the weight of invasions and civil wars, some sections of the Roman army could no longer afford to train and equip their soldiers as well as before. Armor and weapons, for example, the classic Roman helmet, were no longer standard. They didn't have the technology, because technology means money, and money was short. So they just used what they could. And with this sort of thing, you'd just hammer out two halves, like an Easter egg, and then put them together with this. So basically, although you're keeping, trying to keep to a to a standard of design, the actual uh, technical ability of them produced this. In some cases, the Roman armor of earlier times, like chain mail or segmented armor, gave way to cruder examples. The links of mail are uh, difficult to produce. They were mostly riveted. So we got to this sort of period where uh, these blokes were finding alternatives to mail and the, the plate. So stamping out or cutting out small links and basically sewing them together with leather will produce something that's basically stab-proof and, and hack-proof for a limited military engagement. Archaeological evidence found in the frontier forts suggests a decline in standards. It doesn't matter whether it's the, the quality of the currency, the jewellery, uh, the armour, the, the style of the buildings. It all becomes rougher um, and cheaper as the centuries wear on. Uh, it's no great surprise, I don't think, but uh, it's just reflecting, really, what is happening uh, in Rome. As the Western Empire began to slide, recruitment for the army became much more difficult. The minimum height requirement was lowered from 5 feet 8 to 5 feet 5. But service, once considered an honor, 
was now often avoided at almost any cost. People cutting off their thumbs to render themselves ineligible for military service and all sorts of things, cases of this evading military service, but not just by the individuals concerned. The big landowners don't want to lose their labor supply, so they use all forms of influence and graft and everything to keep the uh, recruiting officers off their estates. For many Roman citizens, it wasn't just the desire to avoid conscription. There was a feeling that they might be better off if the barbarians did take control. There was a general disaffection and an unwillingness of people to serve in the army and, frankly, less and less interest in the survival of the Western Empire. People were often quite happy to live under the rule of a, a Germanic prince because he, he was perhaps more capable of defending them and uh, also the taxes were probably lower. So the empire, consequently, fell apart. The Western Empire was declining the fastest and in the year 395, the unofficial split between East and West became official, with the West and the wealthier East ruled by separate emperors. This move hastened the decline of the West by lowering its ability to defend itself. In uh, the late 390s, the Eastern Emperor effectively managed to steal a large number of the Western Army's best regiments to replace many of those, I guess, that were lost to Adrianople and this left the West really very vulnerable thereafter. Also in 395, the Goths living inside the empire revolted under their leader Alaric. They raided Greece and moved north and raided northern Italy. About the same time, other Germanic invaders, including the Vandals, poured across the Rhine, sacking the city of Trier and sweeping into Gaul. In 410, Alaric and his Goths sacked Rome, something that hadn't happened for 800 years. It was an omen for the West. The Goths then left Italy and created their own kingdom in southern France. Other Germanic tribes took over large parts of Spain, and the Vandals captured North Africa, including Carthage. Britain was surrendered in the year 410, with the emperor telling Britons they'd have to defend themselves. By the mid-400s, the Western Empire was on the verge of collapse. The Western Roman army, disunited, outnumbered, and underfinanced, had no real chance of holding off the threat, especially as they had helped train the invaders in the past by recruiting them into the Roman army. And these people come over, serve under Roman orders, but then very often they take off back again. And therefore, they've learned a lot, uh, not only about techniques and so on, but I mean actual military intelligence. They know where to attack if they come back uh, on the other side. The big example is Alaric, Alaric the Visigoth, the chap who actually captures Rome in 410. He had been off and on serving under Roman orders for a good many years before he does this. Despite their name, barbarians, the invaders were not out to destroy the empire. On the contrary, Many wanted to live the Roman lifestyle. Everywhere, the wealth of Rome is acting like a magnet. And the barbarian groups across the frontier are organizing themselves to start preying on that wealth. The Roman Empire has created a rich territory. And the barbarians, uh, like the mafia in the 1920s and 30s, are organizing to exploit it. In fact, the Romans and their invaders were still prepared to join together to fight a common threat. In the mid-400s, that threat was Attila the Hun. The Huns had already created their own empire in Germany and began making raids into both Roman empires, east and west. The roads are truly ferocious. They go all the way from the gates of Constantinople, Istanbul, as now is the gates of Paris, east to west, and also to Milan in northern Italy. The Huns' policy was to destroy all in their wake. The Chinese had built their great wall to keep them out. The Huns were brilliant horsemen who could fire long-distance arrows while at full gallop. To slow the Huns' advance, the Romans had to rely on other barbarian warriors already within the empire. In 451, on the fields of the Champagne district, Attila's army was met by a so-called 
Roman army, made up of Romans, Burgundians, Franks, and Goths, who fought Attila to a standstill. The fifth century is actually about one group of barbarians fighting another group. Sometimes we call them Romans, sometimes we call them Goths and Vandals. In a sense, we lose sight of a force that can be clearly labeled Roman. So to talk about the defeat of the Roman army, in a sense, is to make this process more clear cut than it actually was. Attila then raided Italy, but was bribed to leave. And after he died in 453, the Huns lost their unity and were overthrown by their own subjects in Germany. The Western Roman Empire suffered much the same fate. Throughout the 400s, it had been turning into a mosaic of German kingdoms, and Italy itself became the final domino to fall. In 476, the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, was forced by the Goths to abdicate. The Western Empire was gone, but the Roman army and its influence were not. History speaks of the fall of the Roman Empire, but the Western Empire did not really fall. Rather, it was transformed by gradual assimilation, with the Romans and barbarians becoming more and more like each other. Look, it's just much less exciting, I know, to think of accommodation and assimilation. It's much better to think of hairy barbarian hordes charging across frontiers. But I think it's unlikely that it happened that way. I'd go for a much slower process in which by the 5th century, actually in Gaul and parts of northern Italy, it's difficult to spot the difference between a Roman and a barbarian. One reason is that in most cases, the invaders kept things much the same. They lived Roman lifestyles, preserved Christianity, and used Roman citizens to run the affairs of state. Barbarians certainly enjoyed Roman civilization. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence to that effect. When the Vandals get to North Africa, uh, they start to wear togas, hang about in the baths, and go to circuses, build themselves villas, and decorate them with mo Roman style mosaics, portraying themselves as Roman aristocrats. As for the Roman army in the West, it was never officially disbanded. As the empire fell apart, many legions simply stopped receiving their pay, and they melted back into the local population. That's what seems to have happened on Hadrian's Wall. The coinage has just about disappeared, and therefore one has to speculate based on evidence of what we know about from other provinces elsewhere. And here, certainly my view is still the one that they gradually fade away. Although the Western Roman Empire and its army disappeared, the Eastern Empire and its army continued to flourish. The Eastern Empire, known today as Byzantium, had always been the wealthier half, and its borders were less vulnerable to attack. The East's major military antagonist was the Persian Empire, with, with which the Eastern Empire had very serious wars, but at least they could uh, achieve treaties with the Persian um, king, and this could bring long periods of peace. So it was actually perhaps a rather easier task for the East to defend itself than for the West. Although the look of the Eastern army gradually changed, at its core, it was still run along the same fundamental lines as Roman armies of the past. It maintained in the long term uh, standing regiments. It also uh, maintained the disciplinary system, the command structure, the logistical system, uh, and, and so on. It was the professional nature of the Roman army, which lasted at least for some centuries into the Byzantine period. In fact, in the 500s AD, the Eastern Army briefly reclaimed several provinces of the old Western Empire, including Italy and Northern Africa. Although it gradually changed, this army maintained Roman discipline and tactics until the Byzantine Empire was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. That's a continuation of those tactics all the way through 
I think, to the fall of Constantinople in the 15th century. The old Roman army is key to the maintenance of the empire in the east for another thousand years. The Roman army, in its changing forms, can be said to have won and protected empires for some 2,000 years, from the 5th century BC to the 15th century AD. At its height, it was so efficient that it ruled with a standing force that seems almost tiny by modern standards, about 400,000 men. Louis XIV ruled his rich kingdom, which was nonetheless simply one province of the old Roman Empire, with as large a standing army as the Romans had required to control this vast area from Scotland to the Sahara Desert to Iraq to the Black Sea. That is a staggering feat. The Roman army changed warfare forever. It was the first truly professional army, and it introduced concepts of discipline and training that still influence armies today. Its great military successes have always been famous. The name of Julius Caesar has never really been forgotten. Consequently, it formed the obvious model for the armies of the modern nation states of the West uh, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And many of our own military traditions are based on at least the way our generals have imagined Rome once was. If Julius Caesar and the other great Roman generals could see a modern army, they'd recognize many similarities, such as discipline, command structure, and logistics. But they'd also notice a big difference. The Roman army at its height was more ruthless with defeated enemies. If the great Roman generals had been running campaigns in Vietnam, if they'd been running Desert Storm, then we need have no doubt at all that Hanoi would have been captured and razed, that Baghdad would have been flattened, its inhabitants slaughtered, any survivors sold into slavery. We like to think of the Romans as civilized, and partly that's true, but the Roman Empire has a hard edge, and that's the hard edge of conquest and of brutality. In front of the Roman war machine lies conquest and blood. Because of that paradoxical mix of ruthless conquest and the spread of civilization, the Roman army's legacy to us today goes well beyond military matters. Much of Western culture is based on the civilization that the Roman army took with it as it colonized Europe. Many Western languages, including French, Spanish, and Italian, are based on the Romans' own language of Latin. Also, Western architecture, coinage, art, and law. Indeed, so much of our modern life can be traced to the spread of the Roman Empire. And that empire was the creation of the Roman army. There would not have been an empire without it.